Good morning again. I think our prayer concerns are all listed in um, our bulletin, so I'll let you refer to that, unless there are others that you wish to lift up this morning. Debbie. Uh, Tuesday, we will have a new member of our family, so if y'all keep running around the center, don't you all keep uh, splitting and taking everybody in prayer? Tuesday, Lyd is scheduled to have her baby, so we celebrate that and just keep the Alexander family in prayer. So, others this morning. All right, let us pray. Oh, gracious God, we give a thanks for the celebrations that are in our midst. We give thanks for crops that grow. We give thanks for new babies born. We come to you with our concerns, Lord. We come to you with those who grieve, with those who are seeking a better place, for those who know not what way to turn. We ask, Lord, that as in the scriptures, that you would bring healing and faith and love and strength to all of those in need. For we know, Lord, that when people need healing, you hear them. Lord, send us companions who can look in a pain face and not turn away, who can look at our bruises and scars and not pull back, who can hear anger and rage and not run away, who can touch fragile bodies with tenderness and not pity, who can stay through the dark nights and shadowed days. So we ask, Lord, that you would touch us and use us to be the neighbor, the friend to those that are in need. And now, Lord, we pray as you have taught us to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The scripture this morning comes from Mark chapter 6, verses 30 through 34 and 53 through 56. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him everything they had done and taught. Many people were coming and going, so there was no time to eat. He said to the, the apostles, come by yourselves to a secluded place and rest for a while. They departed in a boat by themselves for a deserted place. Many people saw them leaving and recognized them, so they ran ahead from all the cities and arrived before them. When Jesus arrived and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Then he began to teach them many things. When Jesus and his disciples had crossed the lake, they landed at Gennesaret, anchored the boat, and came ashore. People immediately recognized Jesus and ran around that whole region bringing sick people on their mats to wherever they heard he was. Wherever he went, villages, cities, or farming communities, they would place the sick in the marketplaces and beg him to allow them to touch even the hem of his clothing. Everyone who touched him was healed. May God add his blessing to the reading of the word. It's about people. Not many movies will require an actor to learn Aramaic or to be covered in blood. However, if you look back several years to <clears throat> around 2004, a movie came out that most of you will probably remember and have seen called The Passion of Christ, written by uh, Mel Gibson, and he directed it as well. And the movie was somewhat violent. Yet it did very well at the box office. It grossed more than six million and received three Academy Award nominations despite its R rating. If you didn't see it, the movie portrays the life and death of Jesus in the last 12 hours of his life. Currently, however, Gibson is working on another sequel to be released in 2022 
which will likely be called the Passion of Christ Resurrection. It will focus on the three days between the death and resurrection of Jesus. Jim Cavazell, playing Jesus, says it's going to be the biggest film in history. It's that good. The word passion comes from the Latin word passio, which means suffering. Usually, however, when we think of the word passion, we speak of it as romantic passion or as a hobby or we have a certain passion for a sport and that kind of thing. The Gospel of Mark says that when Jesus encountered a large crowd, he had compassion on them. But this verse doesn't come from the last 12 hours of Jesus' ministry, but from early on when he was ministering in the Galilee region. I suppose if one were to make a movie about this time period, it might be called The Compassion of Christ. Not passion, but compassion. Compassion is such an important word in Scripture, and it doesn't take us very long to figure out what it means. Passio means suffering, and the prefix com means with. So when you put those two words together, you get suffering with or with suffering. When we look at the Greek word from the time in which the Gospel of Mark was written, the word compassion is a bit more graphic And it means that one was so strongly moved by something that they felt it in their bowels or deep within their gut. And Jesus not only then was sympathetic towards a person's plight or had an awareness of their distress of the people around him, it's coupled with this strong feeling and desire to alleviate their suffering. He feels compassion not only in his heart, but in his very being, in his guts. Mark tells us that Jesus has compassion because the people were like a sheep without a shepherd. And so he began to teach them many things. The point being that when Jesus shows compassion towards the people around him, that meant he was suffering with them. In today's text, We find that Jesus and the disciples are traveling the countryside and they're casting out demons, curing the sick, and they're busy with all of those that are coming to them, so much so that they haven't even had a moment to rest or to eat. So Jesus tells the disciples to hop onto a boat and to go away to a deserted place across the Sea of Galilee to enjoy some rest and some relaxation. But their plans get quickly derailed when the people began to see where they are headed. And so they hurry up to meet him there, and they get there ahead of Jesus. Consequently, when Jesus' boat lands on shore, there is already a huge crowd that is waiting for him. Despite Jesus being weary, He doesn't appear at all to be overly annoyed that his time of rest and relaxation is being interrupted. Nor does he appear to be really irritated and frustrated by the enormous needs of the people facing him and that they're unable to help themselves. He doesn't rebuke them. He doesn't say, go get your own food. He doesn't say, I don't have time for you. He has compassion. He has compassion for them. In other words, Jesus suffers with them so much so that he wants to do something about it. He doesn't just kind of think about it. He is so moved that he wants to do something. So as our text makes clear, Jesus then becomes the good shepherd, the one who invites people to sit down in groups on the green grass, much like we read in Psalm 23, when the Lord makes the people lie down in green pastures. As prophesied then, Jesus is the good shepherd that is predicted by the prophets, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and Isaiah as the one who teaches his people, provides them with food, heals their sick and the injured. Isaiah says, like a shepherd, God will tend the flock, He will gather the lambs in his arms and lift them 
into his lap. He will gently guide the nursing ewes. The good news is this. In Jesus, our good shepherd has come. The question the text raises for us is this. Do we as the Christian community have the compassion of Christ? And if you want to bring it a little closer to home, do I have the compassion of Christ? Am I willing to suffer with the hurting people around me? Do I feel the compassion that Jesus had in my guts? In the book, Compassion, a Reflection on the Christian Life, Henry Nouwen notes that compassion asks us to go where it hurts, to enter into places of pain, to share in brokenness, fear, confusion, and anguish. Compassion challenges us to cry out with those in misery, to mourn with those who are lonely, to weep with those in tears. Compassion requires us to be weak with the weak, vulnerable with the vulnerable, and powerless with the powerless. Compassion, he says, means the full immersion in the condition of being human. And when we look at compassion that way, it becomes clear that something more is involved than just a general act of kindness or tenderheartedness. It requires us to put our whole self in, so to speak. It requires us to sometimes be somewhat uncomfortable in the tension um, that somebody's fear or hurt or pain can bring into our midst. So it's not surprising that when compassion is understood as suffering with someone, it evokes sometimes a deep resistance and even protest within ourselves. Even though the United States is a wealthy country, 35 million Americans are unable to acquire enough food on a daily basis to meet their needs. Over 13 million households experience food insecurity, and that was in 2019, a problem that has been made worse by the pandemic. And sadly, households with children are more likely to face hunger than those without children. In America, we have a food insecurity problem. Sometimes I think it's difficult for us to sit with that. Sometimes it is difficult for us to realize that there are people who we know whose shelves are empty. I'll never forget, I had, um, when I was serving a church, we went to a mission once a month to serve food. And I always made my children go, and I always made them help serve. And we were in the serving line, and a family came through, and a little girl was with them. And one of my kids started to cry. And I said to her, I said, what's wrong? And she said, Mommy, I didn't know that I had a friend in my class that was hungry. That is compassion at its most basic level. When we see it and we feel it so deeply in our own unawareness that it pulls us in to some kind of action. You know, if we would have read the verses that were tucked between the verses that we read today and that what we didn't, we would find the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. And what this tells me is that when Jesus faced the hungry, he fed them. It's that simple. He saw the hungry, hurting, sick, and broken people and fed and healed them in whatever way he could and told the disciples to do the same. Today, we're those disciples. Today, we're the disciples that Jesus tells to do the same. He feels compassion, and he acts on it. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the little free libraries that used to be around, and they were, many, they were very popular a few years ago. I loved them. And I loved them because, first of all, it gave me somewhere to put all the books that I had stockpiled. 
But it also gave me an opportunity to, to read authors that I would never read. Um, and it gave me that opportunity not to have to go to Barnes and Nobles and spend all of my book allowance at Barnes and Nobles because I have one of those. I only get to go so often because I buy a lot of books. But anyway, people would love these little house-shaped boxes and they would put them outside their homes or their businesses, churches, and they would fill them with books for people to borrow. In the midst of the pandemic though, what happened with a lot of these little free libraries were that they turned into little free food pantries. With, they were then filled with canned goods and box goods for um, people just to come and take. The neighbors would just come and take what they needed. Some people filled them, some people took from them. But it was a way to care and to have compassion for the people who kept an eye on the pantry's food supply. Now, it, it's easy to say, well, we have a food pantry in town. Yes, we do. And it is a great food pantry. They do a lot of good work and they serve a lot of people in our community. But I can tell you it's almost never enough. And sometimes things happen in your week or in your month or unexpected things and you don't quite qualify. But you still need food. And those little pantries fill the gaps for people who would otherwise maybe not have something. Sometimes our hours don't line up with food pantry hours. So sometimes those little free pantries fill the gaps for people who otherwise would have not had access to services. People who fill those pantries and do those things are acting with the compassion of Christ. It's a simple enough act of compassion and something that any Christian or any church can do for that matter. I often wonder what would it be like just to have a little free food pantry out there? What would that be like just for people to know that we cared enough just to stock a few items in case it was needed? Jesus also made a point of healing people. After the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus and his disciples cross the sea to Galilee, and when they land in Gennesaret, the people of the region recognize Jesus, and so they start bringing all of their sick to wherever he is. And whenever Jesus went into the villages and the cities and the farms, the sick would beg to touch the fringe of his cloak. Mark tells us that all who touched him are healed. Folks, Jesus does his healing in villages, in cities, and farms, among the rich and the poor, the undeserving and the deserving, adults and children alike. Jesus does not discriminate. All who come into contact with the cloak of Jesus are healed in whatever way Jesus heals. So how do we be the cloak of Jesus today in this time and place. In southwestern Virginia, I know that's a long way away from Indiana, but in southwest Virginia, the cloak of Jesus is being touched. We're in a remote area, a medical clinic dispenses free medical care to people who have no other options. And over the course of three days, thousands of people come to Wise County Fairgrounds to be seen by physicians, dentists, eye doctors, and so forth. Similar clinics, it's true, are popping up all over nationwide, but this has been known to be one of the biggest that is around. And about a third of the patients are unemployed. The clinic is the last resort for people who can't afford insurance or don't qualify for medical care or Medicaid. Some have their teeth pulled, some have eyes checked, some have painful joints examined, and some get help from Christian counseling groups. This isn't about politics, said the governor of Virginia during the visit to the clinic. Bright agreed the hospice director. She said, it's about people. It's about people's lives, said the governor, and he's right. When we have compassion, when we feed people, 
When we touch people's lives with the compassion of Christ, it becomes about people and it's not about politics. When we offer medical care to the poor, support free clinics, or work to expand medical access in our communities, we are suffering with our brothers and sisters in Christ and our neighbors in need. We are being a part of offering the cloak of Jesus in the world today. Our challenge is always to suffer with people as Jesus does, people who are young and old, male and female, black and white, gay and straight, citizens and non-citizens, green card or no card, rich or poor, moral or immoral. It does not matter. We are called to suffer with people wherever they are in their suffering. Because when Jesus looks around and sees that the people around him are a sheep without shepherd, he teaches, he feeds, and heals them. And the disciples of Christ today are called to do likewise. Jesus feels compassion deep in his guts, without discrimination, and without asking why they need help in the first place. You know, I think we do that. Sometimes we get caught up in, well, why do they need help? Well, why does it matter? Why does it matter? If somebody needs help, if somebody needs a healing touch, a kind word, a can of soup, why does it matter? It doesn't. We are called to offer the cloak of Christ today. It's an important point because there are people today who are really quick to pass judgment on those who are homeless, on those that are poor or ill with one of the diseases of poverty, AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis, and heart disease, among others. Philip Yancey, in the book What's So Amazing About Grace, writes, a prostitute came to me in wretched straits, homeless, sick, and able to buy food for her two-year-old daughter. And through sobs and tears, she told me she had been renting out her two-year-old daughter to men. She made more renting out her daughter for an hour than she could earn on her own in a night. She said she had to do it to support her drug habit. He said, I could hardly bear hearing her sordid story for one thing. It made me legally liable. I am required to report cases of child abuse. I had no idea, he said, what to say to this woman. So at last, he said, I asked her if she ever thought of going to a church to help. And he said, I'll never forget the look of pure, naive, and shock that crossed her face. She said, the church? The church? Why would I ever go there? I was already feeling terrible about myself. They just make me feel worse. Yancey says what struck him about the story is much like the prostitute. In the Bible, women fled to Jesus. Women like this prostitute fled to Jesus, not away from him. The worse a person felt about them, he says, the more likely they saw Jesus as a refuge. <clears throat> Unfortunately, in many cases, those woman, that woman's words are true. Why would I ever go there? Why would I ever go there? That's the question that we really have to ask ourselves. Has the church lost the gift of compassion? Have I lost the gift of compassion? Because evidently the down and out who flocked to Jesus when he lived on earth no longer feel welcome among his followers today. So we have to ask what's happened. It's a good question, and it really is one we have to ask. <clears throat> and it's not one that we can answer this morning just sitting here on Sunday morning in the pew. It's a question you kind of have to take home with you, and you kind of have to live with it and roll it around in your gut and really ask that question, what's happened? 
Again, I ask you, do we as First United Methodist Church in Elwood, Indiana, have the compassion of Christ? How can we be the cloak of Jesus in our community today? And again, that's not a question you can answer right this minute. It's a question you have to take home with you, roll around in your gut, kind of look around in the neighborhoods and in the little hovels around the community and begin to ask, how can we have the compassion of Christ? Because I think there's a lot that we can do to help, and we do a lot in this congregation, but there's a lot more that we can do to help as we seek to be like Jesus and feel compassion for others deep in our gut. We can stock little free food pantries or support free medical clinics. We can support international efforts, which we do, which are focused on preventing tuberculosis, malaria, and AIDS. We can become a vaccination site for COVID vaccines. Good efforts are underway everywhere to prevent diseases and treat victims, and Christian hospitals continue to be a source of much of the available health care in areas of maximum poverty. So how do we help our hospitals serve others? You know, when I was talking to someone the other day, I was checking on them to see how their surgery, surgery went. She's a clergy friend, and she says, well, I haven't had my surgery yet. She said, it's been postponed twice. And I said, really? And she said, yeah. She said, they don't have enough blood in the blood banks to do the surgery. You know, while I was mass asking, or making a pastoral call, asked Beth how the church could help. And here's what she said. She said, you can give blood. So many people need blood, and blood banks are hurting today. Folks, her response is the compassion of Christ in our midst. We could host a Red Cross blood drive in our church. Just recently, our United Methodist Women put out a call to collect small duffel bags for foster children because it's not uncommon for them to come with their limited belongings in trash bags. We can collect duffel bags easily enough. That's the compassion of Christ in our community. Giving a child a suitcase instead of a bag, it doesn't sound like much, but it's a big deal to a little child that's being taken away from their home, and they no longer have to carry their stuff around in a trash bag. That's the compassion of Christ, bringing the cloak of Jesus to others. Wherever Jesus went, says Mark, needy people begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. Yes, those who touched it were healed. Jesus healed every way, everyone in some way without discrimination. Wherever Jesus went, he suffered with the people, and he did what he could to help them. Not everyone can do everything, but we can all do something. Not everyone can do it all, but each and every one of us can do a little bit. Our challenge is to assist people in the same way that Christ did with the compassion of Christ, because when we offer food to the hungry, medical care to the poor, build and stock little free food pantries, give blood, provide for foster children in our midst, we are showing the compassion of Christ in our midst. And we are being disciples who offer compassion to those that come to us for help. So let us be the church that people feel free to come to. And when they come, they touch the cloak of Christ and are healed. Let us pray. O oh, gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for your word today. We give you thanks that you are there to remind us of what your compassion looks like. <clears throat> there are so many ways, Lord, that we can be the compassionate people of Christ. And so, Lord, we pray that as we leave from here, we would roll that around in our hearts and minds and that you would show us how it is that you would call us to be the compassion of Christ in the midst of our community. In the name of Christ we pray, amen.